In a small garment factory in Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, a class of new recruits is being taught how to lock stitch. American Wanda Bianchini is here to help tackle the learning curve. But what we have are a lot of students that have never worked at all, any place. They need to learn everything, from the work ethic to running the machines to sewing to threading. The very first day, they were a little intimidated by it. This initiative is being funded with U.S. government dollars. It represents a significant rethink of foreign aid harnessing the potential of the private sector to rebuild a fragile country, alongside more traditional humanitarian assistance. Twenty-year-old Rosaline Menard never went to school and can't read, but she's hoping a job in Haiti's garment industry will change her life and improve her country, too. Haiti is still a struggling country, to be sure. But for the first time in years, there is a palpable feeling of hope here. And ground zero is this industrial park, where factories mothballed during years of instability are now being brought back to life. The goal is to create tens of thousands of jobs as fast as possible. From the 1960s through the 1980s, under the dictators Papa Doc and his son Baby Doc Duvalier, Haiti was known for assembling garments for the U.S. market. But after the ouster of the Duvaliers, the country spiraled into chaos with a series of coups, an economic embargo, and paralyzing street violence. Investors fled. By 2006, Haiti had hit a miserable low point. It was really uh, a war zone. Factory owner George Sassine remembers the gang violence that spread from a nearby slum to his factory walls. Bullets coming through the roof, hitting workers. The last one was sitting right here, as a matter of fact, and we just fixed the hole. And every time it was a panic and uh, production uh, suffered. And um, after a while, I, could not, I was losing too much money, so I had to close. But just as Sassine was closing his doors, the tide started to turn. The election of President René Préval reduced political strife and brought in a series of reforms. With Préval's blessing, a United Nations peacekeeping force already in the country resolved to get tough on the crippling gang violence, even taking casualties. Within months, the urban warfare had largely stopped. Haiti's population has mostly accepted the peacekeepers, especially the Brazilians, whose own experience with city slums helped them understand the job here. It's the poorest area of Port-au-Prince. They still patrol the slum of Cité Soleil, which just a few years ago was perhaps the most dangerous place in the Western Hemisphere. Outside what used to be a main gang headquarters, still pockmarked with bullet holes, Brazilian peacekeepers today serve more as crossing guards than warriors. Haiti is no longer the place where people are kidnapped by the score every month. It is no longer a place where armed people drive around in vehicles shooting up the town. U.S. Ambassador Kenneth Merton is back in Haiti for the third time in his diplomatic career. He says U.S. government policy in Haiti is now being reshaped to take advantage of this moment of stability. We've gone through periods where we have pulled back in, in our dealings with the Haitian government. It, that is to say we have chosen not to deal with the Haitian government, chose to work around the Haitian government. That is not our policy now. We need a partner here to work with, and that partner can't only be other NGOs. It needs to be the Haitian state. The task of rebuilding Haiti is undeniably huge. It is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. More than half its people live on just a dollar a day. Public services like health care and a free education are almost non-existent. Somebody say that we would just want to get out of misery to get into poverty. And I believe that's a beautiful sentence for Haiti because it's exactly what we are aiming for right now. Jean-Max Bellerive is Haiti's prime minister. We are a country where 70% of the people are not working. The capacity to increase uh, your internal revenue is almost zero. I believe creating an environment to create jobs is my main concern as a prime minister today. Uh, attracting new investors coming from Haiti or coming from abroad, but mainly creating jobs, creating an, a better environment for investment. From there, I believe you can tackle all the problems. And so, as part of its new initiative to partner with Haiti's government and spur the return of investors, the United States Congress last year passed what is called the HOPE II Act. It allows garments assembled in Haiti to be sold duty-free in the U.S. 
And Haiti's investment push is getting some heavyweight help. Former President Bill Clinton was recently appointed the UN Special Envoy to Haiti. He's come to the country three times this year, with scores of potential investors in tow. They looked at Haiti's garment industry and fledgling agriculture and tourism sites as well. We know that this is a great opportunity not only for investors to come and make a profit, but for the people of Haiti to have a more secure and more broadly shared prosperous future. The whole of Haiti's budget could not have bought that kind of support as advertising, as exposure. President Clinton knocks on somebody's door and tells them, why don't you put 1% of your business in Haiti? That person is going to listen. Clinton's support and the HOPE legislation are keeping Haitian businessman George Sassine busy. Wait for me, wait for me in Mr. Oscar's office. He's now the official local point person for this new investment, and his phones haven't stopped ringing, even during our interview. We have five different people who have five different potential industrial park sites. So I have to, to be like a dispatcher, investors from Brazil, from Ireland, and from Korea coming one after the other. So it's been very hectic, believe me. But it's a good, it's a good problem to have. But all this promise of Haiti's expanding garment industry, even if it lasts, isn't enough to pull this country entirely back from the brink. That's in large part because more than 60 percent of the population here lives in the countryside and risks being left out of Haiti's moment of hope as investment money gets funneled into the city. The idea to get this Clinton as a leader to put attention and to orient attention toward Haiti is key. And uh, his initiative to, to, to bring people to Haiti, to bring investors in Haiti, that's a good thing for the image of Haiti. Yoletta Tien is a longtime grassroots organizer in Haiti. Of course now, Haiti should also take advantage of the opportunities. But it could be important for the international community and the government to negotiate or to give more priority to more sustainable job creation. In particular, Etienne says she wants to make sure the tougher but ultimately more promising area of agricultural development doesn't get sidelined in favor of quick fix garment jobs. Everything should be done to improve the land and to see how that can be used and that can be developed in a more rational way. If we don't try to attract resources towards the rural area, we won't be able to manage the situation in this country. We won't be able to create rich, richness in this country. A U.S.-funded project just outside the capital shows early promise, restoring a 1930s-era irrigation system that was buried under decades of silt and mud so that it can once again feed nearby fields. By providing jobs, Etienne feels programs like this might also help keep the rural population from flocking to the miserable city slums that sprung up during the last garment boom. The first round of a foreign investment in Haiti was in, in the 60s. And that was really influenced a lot the migration in this country. And that created Cité Soleil. Because when they get this factory, in this area of the airport and people coming from the rural area and to stay in Cité Soleil in these abject conditions. If we repeat the same things, we'll get the same result. Etienne also worries the clothing industry will repeat its past labor abuses. It's about some ethics with these investors. How they will respect some ethics? Because of course it's about profit, but profit not based on exploitation of, of the Haitian population. The minimum wage here was just raised to $3 a day. That's still less than half what similar jobs pay just across the border in the Dominican Republic. But it isn't stopping Haitians from lining up for interviews. Right now, the needs are so great here in terms of employment, any employment, really. I, I understand the needs that people see in terms of making sure that workers are treated fairly and are compensated fairly. Those are part of the provisions that are in the HOPE bill where Haiti has agreed to allow um, representatives from foreign labor organizations into the factories to look to make an assessment of how these workers are being treated. Any development, be it urban or rural, will rely on continued stability. And there are worries. The United Nations peacekeeping force won't stay here forever. So it's focusing on rehabilitating and expanding Haiti's police force to one day, perhaps soon, take its place.
It's a tall order to find, vet and educate the 14,000 new officers needed. And there currently aren't enough weapons for them anyway. A recent training exercise focused on protecting the country's political leaders from potential attack. The reason why we need this uh, type of training is, of course, to make sure that this country uh, keeps its stabilization, especially the political stabilization. Protecting Haiti's leaders and apprehending criminals are just parts of the equation. Another key aspect to shoring up this country is judicial reform. The country's legal infrastructure is severely underfunded and open to corruption. At this makeshift court in Cité Soleil, a judge hears cases over a deafening din. Upstairs, suspects are kept in a cramped cell while they await trial. A motorbike, perhaps once part of a case, has been parked in the middle of this chaotic scene for months. In one corner, a program called K-Justice, or House of Justice, offers legal advice to victims otherwise at the mercy of the system. K-Justice and programs like it are bridging the gap while Haiti struggles to build up its own system. That is what is going on here, in a very different scene to what we saw at Cité Soleil. With support from the UN mission, judges from all across the country attend a six-week training session on topics ranging from ethics to legal procedure. For classes. Lionel Bourguin is the director here. You know, without justice, we cannot have security and we cannot have development. Uh, security, justice and development they are matching together. So we need to have good judges, well-trained, competent to do the job, and we will have more security in the country. The last piece of the security puzzle here is political stability, and this is an area where Haiti remains most vulnerable. Tensions heightened recently when 15 political parties, including that of deposed but still popular former president John Bertrand Aristide, were banned from elections coming up next February. Election periods in Haiti have often been turbulent periods. If we have uh, serious problems with the election results that give uh, to, say, potential investors the, problem, the, the perception that Haiti is perhaps entering another period of instability, that will cost Haitians dearly, I'm afraid. U.S. Ambassador Merton says bluntly, Haiti doesn't have many more chances to get this right. We really need them to, to understand that this may be the last time that they are going to have this level of international community interest and willingness to help out, you know, particularly financially, quite honestly. Is this maybe the last time donors are really going to put so much effort into Haiti? I think so. I think so. The situation has become so critical. Now something needs to be done. It's a race against time for Haiti to convince its people and the world that this moment of promise can be made permanent.